Now I'm going to talk about the Cure GM1 Foundation. Okay, a few little facts about the foundation. They've raised over three and a half million dollars so far, and these are grassroots efforts. And then they are the only nonprofit entirely dedicated, solely dedicated to GM1 um, research and drug development. They've held two successful research symposiums, one GM1 family meeting and an extensive, I have to say extensive because it was virtual GM1 meeting back in this fall of 2020, which was great. Really enjoyed that. The foundation has been key in generating partnerships with doctors, research labs, and biotech companies around the world. And their goal is to cure GM1. Um, Here are the board members largely made up of GM1 parents. Christine Wagoner is the president and the co-founder. Her and her husband founded this, this nonprofit. I served on the board as well from 2016 to 2018. And then when I sat down, Don um, Blessing joined the board and Rohan joined as well later. I wanted to share this video with you. This is back from 2018, but this is actually the symposium that I went to with Evan and my daughter. What happens in GM1 and lysosomal storage diseases is that garbage accumulates in your cell and it causes some death. And so it destroys neurons and it destroys the brain and the spinal cord, meaning that it destroys the control center of the body. We've been really interested in working with this group with respect to GM1. Uh, This is a patient-driven group. Uh, It's in its formative stages. It's early. In fact, the whole notion of developing treatments for GM1 is early. Some people may view that as a disadvantage. We view that as an advantage. And what we've begun to see today is the coming together of different stakeholders, including the academics, the patients, and a few biotechs that are just coming into this space. Uh, But I think things are going to move very quickly uh, over the next year or two. Receiving the diagnosis of GM1 for Joey was absolutely devastating because it was just beyond the realm of what we even considered could possibly be wrong with him. What to serve you? Uh, there is a good round. Uh, you have to do uh, collaborative multi center trials. So, having the support of the community becomes very important. It's helping us right now. I just got a good news that there is an animal model that was supported by QGM1, which is great for us. Uh, it makes us very happy. Um, that's actually exactly the point. The most exciting thing I learned today is that there is hope, um, there is a lot of research, um, we just never give up fighting and pushing um, for hope, and also it was just lovely to meet so families in one room, it was great. I felt the same way when I went as well, that it was just, it was really, really cool to meet all the different people and to hear all the research. There's a lot more updated information. You could go to CureGM1's YouTube channel, and I'm going to be talking about the research next. I am going to be attempting to explain the current GM1 research, and these were presentations that were given at our latest GM1 um, virtual meeting in fall of 2020. So first, what is gene therapy? Gene therapy gives patients a healthy version of a defective gene. They're basically using a virus vector and they're putting the correct gene into that virus and then the cell function is restored and the virus is carried throughout the body. The GLB1 gene is the mutated gene for GM1. This is a one-time treatment and because it's a one-time treatment, they have high expectations about it and there will be long-term follow-up. The most damaging effects of GM1 occur in the brain and spinal cord. So it's critical that the therapy reaches those areas and there are various routes of administration. So it could be administered intravenously through the veins or directly into the brain tissue or into the cerebral spinal fluid. And there are a few ways to get it into the cerebral spinal fluid 
There's intracisternal, which is a cavity at the base of the um, skull or into the lateral, lateral ventricles or through lumbar, lumbar puncture. The body will sometimes fight against that virus and develop antibodies, so that is possible. So patients do take immunosuppressing drugs when going through gene therapy. Lysogene was the first company to present. They are right now in the third stage of their MPS3A program, which is a disease that is similar or in the same family, low lysosomal storage diseases as GM1. <clears throat> so now they're moving on to the clinic in their GM1 program. They talked about the blood-brain barrier, how they found that in their studies that when AAV, which is the virus vector that will be used, was given intravenously in an, an animal model that it that had a harder time getting, reaching the brain um, because of that blood-brain barrier that protects the brain. So they are choosing the intracisternal route at the base of the skull to administer. And they found that there was good distribution of the correct enzyme in the brain with that route. They found an increased enzyme activity to normalized amounts in my studies, cats and primates. Depending on the dose amount, that enzyme activity was risen up 20% or up to 60%. And then they do mention that 20% increase would be efficient. The study will include 16 to 18 children. The first stage will include early and late infantile. And later on, they do want to include the juvenile type. They will have sites in Europe and USA and set to start the first or second quarter of 2021. Passage Bio is the next company they have produced a next generation AAV vector as well using that same AAV type of vector and they call it PBGM01. They're going to be working in infantile and late infantile types as well. They are taking the gene, putting it inside the virus, and they mentioned that AAV virus is a very safe virus that has been used in other, many other diseases um, and treatments. So <clears throat> their delivery of choice is also the cerebral spinal fluid at the base of the skull, the cisterna magna. And they said that it does distribute in the brain and brings those cells bring it to the rest of the body. This can be a very invasive approach and can be dangerous. So they have a protocol. They are teaching others how to do it via CAT scan dyes for safety. And their goals are to replace the GLB-1 gene and restore beta-gal levels to consistent with normal brain development and prevent further harm from the disease. In their mice studies, they also showed dose-related improvements in neurological function and survival. And then their top two doses that they gave 100% survived to their endpoint, which was very old uh, mice. So they found that the cisterna magna was the most effective route for the brain. And they also found that the body produced less toxicity and less antibodies via that route. And their trial is set to begin in quarter one of 2021. So right now, and into their late infantile and infantile um, will be next. So Cyogene therapies, formerly Axovant, um, in collaboration with NIH. They have been going for about a year. So they've had their clinical trial going and then they described it as a one-time delivery via intravenous. So they said that the AAV9 does cross the blood brain, brain barrier and it is the most efficient virus at doing that. And so they believe that this delivery of, through intravenous still addresses the multi-system manifestations of GM1 and crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's the only gene therapy to demonstrate restoration in GM1 cats. They will have their six-month data from their first stage that they dosed a low dose in type 2 GM1 patients. And this should be published soon. And their goal is to address um, the brain, the skeletal, the heart, the organs, the cherry red spot, 
and they feel that it reaches all of these areas. And the other advantage that they feel is that intravenous is less invasive. So five patients have already been dosed in this low dose cohort. And then the next dose, the, they'll have two patients that will be dosed in the higher dose for type two. And then they'll begin their low dose for infantile patients and then their higher dose in infantile patients. And what they're looking for is safety. Um, they want to affect the disease progression, obviously, in development. They'll be looking at the clinical, uh, the clinician's perspectives and the, all the natural history studies. They'll be looking at MRIs, their skeletal, speech, swallowing. They'll also do tests to test the enzyme levels as well. So it'll be a comprehensive examination. There were two other groups that presented as well, gain therapeutics and biostrategies. And they both talked about enzyme replacement therapy, which is another way. This is not gene therapy. It's a different approach. Gain therapeutics is not in the clinic yet, but they are developing oral therapies and it's an oral medication compliant for chronic use. They say that it penetrates the, the brain, the bone, and the cartilage, managing unmet needs. They've developed what they call stars, and these stars bind to the surface of the defective protein or enzyme, another word for protein, which will be recognized as normal so that they can reach that final stage in the lysosome part of the cells. And they mentioned that you don't need 100% of the enzyme to decrease the severity and the symptoms of the disease. Biostrategies talked about enzyme replacement therapy and said that it is making the correct version of the enzyme and producing it in animals or plant cells. And so bio actually makes them in plants and it would be administered weekly or biweekly. So why? Protein has a half-life, it gets worn out, and then you have to continue to replace it. So, and then they mentioned that enzyme replacement therapy is an established technology. It is established, it's in many other um, diseases. The problem with GM1 is that proteins don't cross the blood-brain barrier very well. So they are using a new approach. And because GM1 is a neurologic disease as well as a multi-system disease, that's why the blood-brain barrier is a hot topic. They're using plant lectins, um, and that's a protein that binds sugar. And all of our cells are coated with sugar. So she talked about how this lectin is really good at getting into the cells straight to the lysosome and getting past that blood-brain barrier. And they've demonstrated that it can reach all important cells for GM1. Even if the body has developed antibodies, it still tends to, as she described, muscle its way into the cells. So right now they are prepping for a pre-IND meeting with the FDA to get approval for going to the next steps towards a clinical trial. And they also mentioned that they need more partners to continue to get um, further along in um, doing all their toxicity studies. Um, so lots of exciting things happening and there is hope for our sweet baby Lucas. Okay, for my last topic, I'm going to be discussing how to seek or give support to families with GM1 or with rare disease. And one thing I do wanna mention again is that I'm not an expert on some of these topics I'll be discussing such as grief, but I'll just be drawing from my own experiences and using um, some of the things I've learned from my own studies on how to cope. Um, some of the possible challenges that can happen um, for these families is they'll have a lack of diagnosis. It may take a while. And we know that some of these rare diseases are very hard to diagnose at the beginning. So for families, I would say to honor your own intuition that something is wrong and focus on getting a diagnosis. Um, if possible. There was a friend that I was connected with um, via a mutual friend who was concerned about her child. So I talked with her on the phone and um, I told her, you know, if you feel like something is wrong, you really need to focus on trying to get a diagnosis. And I encouraged her to go to some of the bigger cities, uh, go to universities, hospitals, places that have some of the latest research 
um, and to get that diagnosis, it turned out that her son that she was concerned about had Neiman pick type C and he ended up passing away um, a couple of years ago, a couple of younger children as well that have the same disease and they are currently have been getting treatment for the disease, um, trying some different things. So, and others, I would encourage others to support their concerns and to not downplay them because they can be very real. And the earliest something can get diagnosed, the better, because there may be treatments out there. There might be clinical trials going on. So, so that is something that can be a challenge. Another possible challenge is it can be difficult to connect with others because living with GM1 is different. It is outside of normal. It's human nature to fear something that is different. So families can share their experiences and stories and try to educate those around you. And then others can, instead of having, um, giving into that fear to maybe generate some feelings of curiosity and compassion, asking questions and trying to understand what life is like for them. Another challenge can be a high daily physical care load. It doesn't really matter what stage or type of GM1 it is with all stages and all types. There are, it is, it can be a high physical care load, whether it's those physical symptoms of of seizures or just being unable to dress themselves and feed themselves and, or they have other medical needs. They have a lot of medications or they get injured frequently. They're having neurologic decline and it's, it's, can be frustrating for them. So for families, be open to training others to help you maybe so that you can get to the point where you can trust other people other than maybe yourself to help assist with their care. Look into respite services in your area. I know not all locations have it, but that has been something that we've been fortunate to have in our home over the years. Um, and we have that, we have had those services available to us. And others, one thing that you can try to do is to offer to observe and shadow and maybe learn some ways to help care for, for that child so that it's not just all on the caretakers. Other challenges are medical appointments, therapies. It could be a lot of emergencies with some of the physical challenges, procedures. Because it is a multi-system disease, there are a lot of different specialists that the child might see. And then it's possible that there might be clinical trials or studies that, that the child could be enrolled in. And that can be a stress on the family because it can be a couple of months uh, away um, where, you know, uh, a parent needs to take this child to participate or the traveling, et cetera. So families pick and choose maybe what is best for your child. We have over the years, we've gone to some doctors and then not gone to some doctors and we've gone to certain therapies and then not gone to therapies, just depending on what we felt like we could handle. We've participated in some studies and then not in some maybe um, certain things. So you just have to choose what's best for your family and your quality of life. And others can just become a little bit aware of what might be going on and what they what the load is like for them and to be supportive of that. And then finally, grief and disappointment is, is something that is understandable with a degenerative disease. Anticipatory grief is something that I definitely experienced when with Eli, knowing that he was going to die, all of those years leading up to it, I was grieving that knowledge that he was going to die. I've grieved every single loss of, of skill and function that happened over time. And then there were those difficult end of life decisions and having to decide, you know, uh, should we continue feeding them even though they're vomiting all the time? Should we lower the amounts? Should we try this? Should we try that? And, um, and then of course, when somebody passes away, when Eli passed away, we all experience grief, but in different ways, I experienced a lot of, of guilt as part of my grief experience. And it was heavy. It was very heavy for me. So families, 
what can be helpful is to learn to name your emotions and to learn how to process emotions. You know, I've, I've studied about this. And one thing that I've realized is that when you resist those emotions, it's harder for the body to, it feels worse when you resist feeling them and you kind of just push them down, push them down. They want to rise up. And so learning how to process them, how to confront them and how to just kind of feel them in your body, your body will be able to cycle through and kind of release. And our bodies are designed to feel a lot of different emotions and negative emotions, and we don't necessarily need to be afraid of feeling them. So there are many experts out there that can teach you these things. For others, I would encourage them to be sensitive, but to also be direct and open. One thing that I found difficult when Eli passed away was just shooting the breeze with people and talking about random topics. There was so much that I was dealing with that it was hard for me to kind of, you know, be open to talking about other things and just random stuff. I just, I just couldn't handle it very well. So I think being more direct might be helpful of where you just saying, Hey, how have you been feeling since Eli passed away a couple of years ago or whoever it is. And then try not to assume how they're feeling or assume anything, but just try to focus um, on their feelings and their experiences and try to avoid uh, sharing your own feelings and experiences because it can be, we just don't want to put emotions on that grieving person. We don't want to add your own grief to their grief and your own experiences to their experiences, but just to honor what they're going through. And then if they share, you can say something like, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. I'm here for you. And then saying something nice about, about their loved one. Like Eli was amazing. You know, we're here for you. Whatever. I think it's nice if people can express that they haven't forgotten about your loved one. So a couple of other ways I want to share is one is you can support Rare Disease Day, maybe sharing, sharing these videos that I'm making or um, going to rarediseaseday.org and learning some other ways to help support. There's a Cure GM1 Foundation. You can go to their website um, and you can donate to uh, support the Cure GM1 Foundation which is doing such great work, amazing things. Sharing and awareness and donating is always helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for watching this video series and taking the time to learn about this important topic. I will be sharing our feature Rare Disease, Disease Day video tomorrow. So any um, shares, likes, um, comments, and donations to the Cure GM1 Foundation would be amazing, even if it's um, a small amount. That's helpful if enough people do it. So thank you again. And next month I'll be sharing um, another baby lullaby, which is was written for this guy, my little Evan, my third child. So have a beautiful day.